what we're here today to have a look at is uh, the implementation of Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's a book written by Patrick Lencioni back in 2017. It's probably the most appallingly named book I think I've ever seen because it's actually about the principles of high performing teams, but I'm sure someone in marketing thought that was a clever idea. Uh, and what you can see here on the screen is a model that I developed to put operational issues and questions about how to plan and do the business of business right next to some of the people and relationship oriented aspects. So anthropologists would use two different words to describe these two things that need to happen at the same time. They would describe uh, modality and sodality. So modality is what we do together. It's the blue triangle that's upside down. And sodality is who we are together, which is the purple triangle on the left hand side. So every good leader has to manage these two aspects simultaneously. Who are we? What are we doing? And what are we doing affects who we are and who we are affects what we're doing. And that's the reason I put these two triangles side by side. Um, now, Lencioni built the first one on the left hand side. And so I'm going to walk you through the five layers of that. It's a very logical, rational, reasonable model. Uh, it, it, it is non-sequential though, so we're going to start at the bottom and progress our way to the top, but realise that these layers all relate to each other simultaneously in any team. Uh, and then on the right hand side is a model that you would normally have seen the up way, uh, other way up. It's from Bruce Wakefield's book, Planning from Strategic Intent, and it uses a series of language. There are different versions of this in every company, but Every good CEO, GM, senior director, leader of any kind would end up saying, we've got to get clear on our vision. We've got to agree on what our values are as a company. Everybody needs to know what their role is. We've got to decide what our goals are and how to measure them. And then how do we quantify the progress that we're making? So you would, you can include racy diagrams, job descriptions, um, foundational charters, relationship, we know whatever, however you want to get after that, business plan, strategy plan, strategic roadmap, blah, 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 all the stuff companies do all the time, kind of forgetting the relation part that sits mm -hmm. to the left-hand side of that. So I've put these side by side because the layers relate to each other directly. As you build trust, you do need to make sure everyone's clear on the vision of where we're headed. So you're running these two things in sequence as we go. The other thing I would say is that there is a line between performing teams and high performing teams. And I'll, I'll get to that line, but it's a glass ceiling. And um, it'd be interesting to have a conversation with um, individuals who are going through this workshop to say, have you ever experienced a team that's actually cracked high performance and what did it take to get there? So in summary, let's just deal with the left hand pyramid. Uh, and what I'd like you to do is think about your team, and by team I mean the, the group that you feel like you belong to when you go to work, your home team, the team that has your back, that cares about your career, that will stand up for you when it comes to getting a pay rise, that worries about you when you don't turn up for work because you're unwell. So think about your team at work that you go do stuff with. And it's usually no more than eight to 10 people, right? So it's your home base within a much larger organisation. Think about that team and think about your closest, nearest relationship, your most valued loved one. It might be a child, it might be a parent, it might be your significant other. But think about a very personal relationship that you have with someone. So I'll think about my wife and I'll think about my core team who help us build uh, consulting within Providence. In both those cases, you cannot have a relationship if you don't trust one another, right? So trust is the foundation of all relationships, both business and personal, all relationships everywhere, including the person you're buying food from at Woolies, right? You have to trust the checkout person and that they have your best interests at heart and that they're not going to try and catch you for you know, shop stealing when you haven't been stealing from the shop and you trust that the price is the price and you trust that the that you're safe when you go there and you're not going to experience a shooter incident. There's a whole lot of trust involved with going shopping. Now, that trust is implicit and it's stood up because they have security guards at the front door and they have efficient checkout people at the check. 
it's all implied, but you would not shop there if you did not trust them. Does that make sense? So you wouldn't have a relationship with a significant other if there was no trust. You wouldn't go to work if there was no trust. If you thought they were out to get you, you wouldn't show up, right? So for a team to function well, there has to be trust. And this layer relies on ISO 45003. So it relies on the existence of psychological safety. What that means very simply is I can bring my whole self to work and I can express my ideas, be vulnerable without fear of repercussion. So I can ask a dumb question and not be afraid that you're going to rid ridicule me in front of the team. So I can ask any question, I can explore ideas, I can bring smart ideas, dumb questions, and I'm safe to do so because I trust you and you trust me. It's very, very simple. But at the same time, over in that operating model, you and I have to be clear about what we're getting after. What is this team? What are we trying to pursue here in my team consulting at Providence over here in marriage? Hey, Kel, what's life look like now for you and me now that our kids have grown up and left home and we're empty nesters? What is our vision? What are we after? Where are we going? What are we going to do with that next 15 years or, or what have you? So the trust allows you to have vision conversations. If I'm doing vision casting with no trust, what's going to happen? People aren't going to buy in. They're not going to agree. They're not going to express their opinion. They're not going to ask questions about what on earth that means. You know, you're in a some kind of dictatorship or some weird relationship. If You'll never get vision casting without trust, right? So that's going to work. Once we trust each other, we ought to see those ideas being expressed in a meeting where we ask each other curious questions about what that means or what my role might be or what's going on. And so conflict immediately ought to start happening in a functioning team. People are free to bring their ideolo ideological um, constructs and we can debate them in a healthy way. Notice um, we're not having a personality conflict. We're not having a moral conflict. We're not arguing each other about who's right. We're bringing ideas and we're debating them right, with each other. Why? Because I trust you've got my best interests at heart. I agree with where we're going. So we can have healthy conflict. Immediately, you'd start seeing red flags, right? So you turn up to a meeting and people are being quiet or they're not sharing their ideas or nobody asks questions until the boss leaves and then we all start talking to each other about what a dumb idea that is. We don't have a high-performing team. We don't even have a team yet, right? So if we can't have those conversations. Conflict is right next to values because you and I need to agree what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do in these arguments, right? We have to agree what our uh, demonstrated behaviours are that we expect from one another. Can I bring my mobile phone to a meeting? Am I allowed to leave the meeting and answer the phone call? Or will you get upset with me, but then not say anything to me because we don't know how to do deb Yeah, So these two things have to run together. We've had a conversation about our values, shared values, and we've had a conversation about how we expect each other to behave uh, in meetings, in emails, in um, turning up to work on time or working from home. What's How are we? What is the way we do this thing together? Do we trust each other uh, and so forth? So you can see conflict and values go together. The minute we've learned to debate ideas and the minute we have learned to argue and discuss and, uh, and talk, then the team gets to make some decisions about which of the hundred amazing ideas we have we're actually going to go after. So we start getting commitment from the team to go after certain things. This is where we have to have clarity and team buy-in. Now, how you make that decision doesn't really matter. It might be highly de democratic and everybody votes, or it's always a captain's call. What matters here is that people feel heard and that they feel like the team and the group has legitimately examined all the ideas and that a decision has been made. It doesn't matter if that's a one person or a team or a group or a democracy, it doesn't matter. I feel heard and this is our decision and this is what we're going after and everybody buys in, right? Having, having experienced the debate over those ideas. This is where teams start to trip up because we hardly ever ask clarifying questions. 
we hardly ever put our hand up and say, boss, I don't understand how that's on strategy. Uh, we hardly ever see this clarification process of people um, checking why their idea was thrown to the to the curb on the way through. Uh, and this is where performance starts to lag. If you don't get public commitment to the idea and sign in an agreement, we're going to see performance start to lag. One of the reasons that performance lags is over here on the uh, operation side is people aren't clear who they report to, they're not clear what their role is, they're not clear what they should be doing versus what she should be doing, how come I'm doing her job. And so you begin to see this passive aggressive behaviour as people buy out of the discussion because they don't feel safe, go all the way back to trust. Right. So when you begin to see a lack of public commitment or public um, signing into things, I always ask the role question, are we clear what we're doing here, vision? Are we clear how we should behave and what's expected, values? Are we clear what our job is, roles and goals? It seems very structural, but that structure actually gives people clarity and permission to test the questions that are being put up and the decisions that are being made. They know I have the right to ask you what that's about because that's in my job. So they can feel comfortable and safe. This is where the glass ceiling is. If you didn't feel it already, this is where most people stop. This is where teams perform and they never get to high performing. Why? Because human beings hate holding each other accountable. Hate it. They do not like saying, didn't we say no mobile phones in the meeting, but you've had your phone on the whole time and you've left twice. So walk me through that. We, we hate confronting people and we don't like holding them to account. What makes it safe in a high performing team is go back to values. We agreed on our behaviours. Go back to commitment. Last week, you even publicly said that you would blah, blah, blah. And I'm just curious what's going on. The other thing about accountability is that it very often turns to ideal, uh, away from ideological debate to personality, right? I don't like it when you turn up to meetings late. Well, well, that's nice. I, I'm busy and I you know, live far away and I've got four kids. We, we, we personalise the issue or we don't address what's actually going on. We address some peripheral issue or we don't like confrontation, so we do it passive aggressively, or we try and triangulate the relationship and tell someone else instead of the person we're actually upset with. Teams that win hold each other accountable. And I mean NBL teams, cricket teams, um, share trading teams, book reading clubs, <laughs> you, know, you name it. Amazing marriages are teams that hold each other to account. I thought we agreed that the way we would parent was this. I'm confused why we're now going stage left. Help me understand why we're doing this. Oh, I'd forgotten that we made that commitment. Right, let's have a conversation about it. You realise now how far uh, up the pyramid we've come because to do that, you have to trust that I have your best interests at heart. For you to receive any kind of feedback from me, you have to trust that I'm watching you and I, I'm, I mean you well. I don't mean you harm, right? And if I can't have that conversation, I've got to go all the way back down and work on trust again and say, where did you and I stop believing that we were on the same tip? Where did you and I get, you know, these are the cycles we go through. Now, accountability, accountability to what? That's why goals are there, right? We're holding each other to account for the goals we agreed collectively and the targets we agreed down there at the commitment layer on the left hand side. The goals are important. They're set by individual, by team, by division, by company. And of course, high performing teams, once we get through that accountability layer, bam, we're going to start seeing once a week, once a month, once a quarter conversations about collective outcomes. We're going to be having people say, hey, Roger, I know that business development team really needs to do that, but didn't we agree that as a company we were going to go over here and focus on the delivery group who were going to, yeah, we did do that. That's right. No, I have got a bit one-eyed about my division. You're right. We have a collective outcome and that's what we're headed for. Collective outcomes are really, really important because the team, you know, together, everybody achieves more team, ends up doing more together than they do as a bunch of collectives. What's important about collective outcomes? Measurement. So you actually know whether we've hit it or not. 
and you've got KPIs, you've quantified the progress and you've got after it. So that in a nutshell are, are the two pyramids put together. Remember the two words, modality, what we do together, sodality, who we are together at a very, very simple level. And you can see, you can probably now litmus test your own family relationships. We're coming up on Christmas right now. So you can already say, oh, I, I can see where my family is, my nuclear family is on that sodality pyramid where we don't even do conflict well. We all sort of pretend that we like grandma and we tolerate our strange uncle and we never talk about Aunt Mary. You know, okay, we haven't even got past conflict, right? So, so as a family, there's some work to do maybe. Uh, or maybe you've got a high-performing um, family of origin and you're just, you're nailing it. So, you know, good for you.